Hello and welcome to Form First Podcast. My name is Laura. And my name is Peter. We are the founders of Form First Fitness app. In this podcast, we will be covering topics ranging from health, fitness, injury prevention, and how technology can help us as athletes to get better while staying healthy. We would be boiling down complex sports science topics, bringing you the latest research from the field of fitness and technology, and basically helping you to be a more educated athlete by bringing best practices and sustainability to your training. Join us today for another episode of Form First Podcast, where we will be talking about sports technology trends. Nice, let's go. I'm sitting here with my colleague Peter and uh, today we're going to be talking about sports uh, technology trends and we did a little bit of research within the field of sports tech and we wanted to kind of present to you a little bit of uh, what we found and what seems interesting and have a little discussion of uh, what we think is kind of really interesting, what would probably be the bigger uh, kind of game is going to present more uh, more interesting development uh, for the field of sport and just a little clarification we decided to keep it super current so we have included only trends from this year 2020 and maybe a few from uh, last year as we are still far too little into the current year. Yeah, the latest and greatest. Yes, <laughs> definitely. And yeah, we just want to do our own evaluation of what we find most interesting and more exciting and how we see this impacting our life as athletes. And I did, do think it's maybe a little bit interesting as well to cover essentially what our product is doing and what our technology is doing. And maybe we can also cover a little bit of our own background so people can understand where we're coming from and in a sense what we're trying to achieve. Yeah. So, I personally come from a, more of a tech background. Yeah. So you've been a developer I, for. Yeah, I've been a developer. I'm educated as a developer, and the field of sports. Uh, I mean, it's not exactly new. I've been doing. I've been dabbling in sports a little bit here and there for the last couple of years, and more seriously interested in CrossFit. I would say for the last year. Yeah. Or year and a half, and. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So I, I would say I, I approach this from more of a tech. Yeah, you've been you've been you've been kind of I would say very generally into computers for a long time, haven't you? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I was a I was a nerdy kid growing up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. So and um, from from my side, I I'm definitely coming from a little bit more of a business background uh, professionally, but in a sense of sport, I I grew up with a family of coaches. My parents actually met at sports school. Uh, and I have always been around sports and, and, and people that practice, professional athletes, coaches. And I've done sports for most of my life. And I've done all kinds of stuff. I've played basketball and handball. I've done wall climbing, swimming. I've done taekwondo. Um, together with you, CrossFit. I even used to coach basketball in high school and um, at the university. I actually coached my own university basketball team when I was uh, studying uh, in England. And uh, also, um, currently I got, uh, recently I got a certified level one uh, uh, CrossFit coach. So I can also, That's in cool. theory, in theory, teach uh, people how to do kind of, um, you know, uh, funky exercises that CrossFit involve. <laughs> but yeah, I definitely have a way more passion for sport. And I recently joined the field of tech, which kind of definitely got me excited thinking about what can we do from, you know, with all the available technology that is in there and how can we make just sports practice better and and just kind of lever this because even that sports technology have been really seeing a rise in the past few years, it is still so much more that could be done and so much great technology that can be levered to, to just help people, um, you know, as we always say, just make their practice more sustainable, help them with anything from their technique to, you know, offer them biometrics and just just, just really help like the everyday person uh, to yeah. practice sport. And I would say that's maybe why we come into the picture. Yeah, exactly. So, Coming from kind of two backgrounds, but kind of also 
lapping, you know, overlapping a little bit. Yeah. Um, and I think we are exactly in this intersection of, of business and sports and technology. Yeah. Uh, we haven't really mentioned this before, but we are building a mobile application that would use state-of-the-art computer vision uh, technology and machine learning to help athletes practicing indoors rowing to improve their technique and their form. And we could definitely dive in way deeper in what the technology entails and how we're exactly doing this. But I think it's probably a good idea yeah, to, to yeah. leave it for another time. <laughs> it's going to be a very long episode if we have yeah. to get into it. Yeah, exactly. Like there is plenty, plenty of detail I could go into, but yeah, yeah let's, let's, let's not, keep it light. Let's, let's yeah. not get it too techy. But yes, I hope this really helps our listeners, listeners to understand what is our fascination with technology and where our product kind of fits into the whole field of sport and why do we care about you know technology and tech trends and that kind of all yeah, makes sense because in the end it is about the application yeah definitely so you know coming back to the to to kind of the research that um, that we did and um, and there are so many interesting stuff happening and and again i don't want to go over too many things but there are certain technologies that are definitely worth mentioning but i also think that we can maybe leave them for another time or just just not discuss them too much because what we're trying to achieve is within the field of personal practice and you bettering yourself as an athlete. And there is also so much fantastic technology that this, you know, has to do a little bit more within, you know, watching, uh, like consuming sport, stuff like watching games online and all the, you know, the availability to kind of stop, skip commercials, rewind and <clears throat> all this, all these things. And, you know, also, of course, the, the rise of social media and how we interact with teams and social media, fantasy sports are huge. And, you know, anything from watching, participating and watching and online sports betting has definitely seen a rise in the past few years. And I definitely think that's going to keep going up and, and how people use it and how companies leverage technology to make it the whole experience better. Um, there is one um, technology kind of, um, you know, step that um, I think will, will basically come um, in 2020 that will definitely impact um, the way we view and the way we stream and consume sports content. And this is the 5G um, enabled edge computing. So Yeah, we can definitely see it in the news early you know, late 2019 and early 2020, we are starting to see 5G networks with, you know, incredibly fast uh, speeds, you know. And how would that, how would that impact? Because I, I, I read a little bit about it, but as the less technical person, I kind of yeah. understand so, it a little bit less, I guess. So, so from, the, from the consumer end, I would say, most people will interact with 5G, 5G with, their, uh, with their mobile phone providers. So you will get uh, much faster internet speeds and you will have much easier and faster access to, you know, watching videos, yeah. uh, having access to all your resources in the cloud, downloading, you know, like Drive and, yeah. and, and stuff. So definitely it will help even the current situation, like working remotely. Yeah. Uh, you know, having faster networks always helps. Yeah, definitely. And especially when we come into something that is very resource intensive as streaming a video. And, yes, and exactly. I guess I, I'm assuming it's also going to reduce the lag yes. uh, from like, especially when you're picking up uh, streams from, you yes. know, from and, really... and this will definitely help other technologies develop. Uh, technologies like uh, VR, which we'll talk about later as well, yep. where uh, the latency is critical. Yeah. Like if you if you deliver frames a little bit too late, it make, makes people sick. So it is very important to to have the yeah. the, the latency under under control. Yeah, definitely. And um, as our research definitely shows that technology is definitely the trend or the trend to look into the sports uh, to this field of sports. And here we have, of course, stuff like, you know, building multi-club memberships, um, kind of the social side and building social hubs around it, you know, um, you know, kind of retail spaces, wellness programs and all this kind of stuff. But tech definitely seems to be the trendiest part and where everybody is looking currently into the field of sports. And 
I know that's probably a little bit on the side of the consumer market, but I just thought that if anybody has their pulse, you know, their hand on the pulse of what's happening in a particular industry, this is definitely the venture capitalist and the VC, you know, the VC yeah. firms. Because in my opinion, it's all, always worth to see what the professionals are looking into and what they find interesting to invest. Because I truly believe that, you know, they, they kind of really, really understand not only what would be big, but also what is kind of really going to bring the most value to the market because, you know, in a simple possible matter, they're, they're looking for what's going to make them the most money at the end of the day. But that's also a great indicator to see what, you know, professional VCs are looking as, uh, as kind of the most attractive technology to invest in. Um, so we actually looked into um, an interesting research done, done by Scrum Ventures, which is an early stage venture capital firm. Um, and what they show in their research is that they believe in 2020, one of the biggest kind of pushes in tech will be athletes, perf- uh, sorry, uh, the fan engagement technologies. Uh, and this is, as we said, all the things that, that we kind of uh, build to, to help people interact as spectators. Um, and then followed, not so closely, but then followed by the athletes' uh, performance technologies. And this is kind of where our product kind of fits in. Uh, this is anything such as coaching platforms, um, you know, tech that helps you kind of recover your health, rehabilitation, wearables, and pretty much, again, anything that can help us uh, improve as athletes. And there is like an interesting technology, but it's still very, very small, um, which is how to improve the, the stadium experience or how to kind of improve the in-venue services, such as ticketing, safety, security, analytics, uh, and, um, you know, even advertising, I guess. But this is more the in-physical stadium experience. Uh, so that is, again, I, again, I'm totally seeing this growing significantly in the next few years and kind of having those smart uh, smart venues, you know, coming more and more. But at the moment, it's actually pretty, pretty small in comparison to the other two. So Yeah, definitely. I think the fan engagement technologies have a margin, not only because there is, you know, there's way more fans than actual athletes. Yeah, yeah exactly. You Practitioners. Know, you always have, you know, even even if you're watching a football match, how many people do you have on the stadium and how many people have playing. Yeah. do you have? Yeah, exactly. No, but even, even if you think about it, you can also think about it, even that, for example, us two are practicing more CrossFit, that doesn't necessarily mean, and often it means that we do follow a lot of other sports. Maybe you like to watch football on top of that. Uh, I recently crazy enjoyed watching the Arnold Strongman competition that went uh, in the States. Um, and and yeah, I just I actually do enjoy watching a lot of sports um, while I'm practicing actually just, just one um, primarily. So definitely the social part and fan engagement, I, I, I definitely see kind of being the top one for a long time. But I also think that there is a lot of potential for kind of building, you know, the field of IoT and helping to build smart venues will be also becoming bigger and bigger as the IoT, uh, which stands for Internet of Things, um, kind of becomes bigger and bigger. And we make smart homes, smart cities, and of course, smart sports venues. So cool. Um, another thing that I think it's worth mentioning is what kind of um, specific sport technology the like capital, uh, you know, uh, venture capital firms are actually looking into uh, investing. And we're definitely going to post those, um, those graphs on our website um, as, as, of course, all the, the research links and so on. But I think it's worth kind of covering a little bit of uh, what it says. Yeah. So I think the, the biggest uh, the biggest contenders are, of course, media platforms. I think that's not uh, just specific for sports. It's, I think, everywhere nowadays. Yeah. So the media and content platforms. But that's the game related to the, to the fan engagement. So that totally yes. makes sense. Yes. Uh, then the other, the, the, I would say the second best or the second most uh, attractive, uh, feel. attractive or sought after is data analytics and biometrics. Which also totally makes sense, like big data and all kind of analytics and what they can tell us. It's huge, not just in sports, just all over. Yeah, so. and I think the, the recent trends in using machine learning and, and similar techniques shows that, you know, we can use data for so many great yes. things. Absolutely. 
Then, then we have the field of esports, yeah. which is actually I see gaining a lot of traction, yes. especially in the younger generation. I was super skeptical. Uh, I mean, it made me feel a little bit old, but yeah, I, I, I feel the same <laughs> actually. <laughs> and we are actually not just just FYI, we are not. But I sometimes I feel like I'm a thousand years old. But I was I was really surprised that esports do have um, a fan base of any like on the ground kind of you know sport i was i couldn't believe that there are like hundreds of like hundreds of thousands of people watching live streams yeah. of and then re-watching millions like watching people playing esports online it's like i was like oh my god that's amazing i think i think i just missed it i mean i the when i was growing up like yeah you you, you know you you played games on your computer, yeah. but it was like you did it by yourself or you did it with a friend and that's it. Yeah, it like I, I never could have imagined that it would turn into something exactly. that's, and that I has think, millions of dollars. Exactly. And right now, you know, being a game, a professional gamer is a legit career. I yeah. mean, you know, us growing up, it was just something that you do for fun and, you know, and it was almost probably considered by a lot of the older generation as like wasted time just, uh, you know, playing games. And uh, it's just showing that those guys are as formidable athletes as I would say any other. And it just requires a certain set of skill that is definitely, um, you know, definitely worth the respect of any other, um, you know, any other athlete. Um, and uh, the traction uh, from viewers and participants definitely shows that esports are, you know, are ready to, I don't know, join the Olympics, you think? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Yeah, you know, actually, you, esports Olympics that yeah, wouldn't be bad. Definitely, um, dear spectators, we now going to see the high jump and <laughs> follow the straight after by a tournament of Warcraft. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I think it would be a separate, uh, you know, separate event. Yeah, separate event. Okay, so we're not going to be jumping from. You don't think we're going to be jumping yeah. from like? And now we're going to have the rower sprints, something, something, and then we're going to have um, I don't know. People playing. I don't know what do kids play these days. I Overwatch. Have no idea. Over. I don't know. I watched. I watched the world finals of Over. Overwatch. Okay. That was very impressive. I mean, I didn't get anything of what's happening, but I was like super impressed that there was about maybe hundred and sixty thousand people watching live, which was insane. I, I thought that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, for me, I, I don't really get uh, any any entertainment from watching people play. So I don't I don't watch or yeah. I don't pl I don't even play games. Really? Yeah. You don't like to watch? <laughs> <laughs> I thought everybody likes to watch. No, not really. Oh, damn. Not, not games. Oh, not right. PC games. <laughs> but no, I like, why, why would I want to? Okay, yeah, let's not get but then, into but, it. But then I was thinking, like, um, and then looking into into the sports that we practice, like CrossFit. Uh, I I I I don't want to kind of make claims because we haven't really looked into it, but 160,000 is just really really impressive. But coming back to the statistics, <laughs> you know, and then of course we have our athlete tech or like performance tech, which is as we said, all the things that help us help us perform better as athletes. Anything from smart apparel, from like um, heat wrecking uh, materials and cloths to to all the fantastic uh, innovation that has happened within production of like apparel shoes that help you retain uh, kind of, uh, you know, momentum and, and, and power or it's just, it's just fantastic. And that durability of, of, of all the apparel and uh, just just is fantastic. Yeah, I mean, in the in this field, there's definitely the technology and and science as well, like material science of what goes into oh, yeah, into into the different materials that make up you know your yeah. your shoes. Yeah, that was not possible like um, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. So that's fantastic, and we definitely, I would say, if we have to put where our product goes in, it's definitely within the athlete and tech performance, uh, which is probably the fi which is the fifth most attractive for VCs, and uh, I would say also I think we fit into the data analytics and biometrics because yeah. we use a lot of data to to actually um, kind of perform our analysis and offer the feedback. Indeed, yeah, yeah. So as we said, I think it's it's. Definitely uh, worth looking into 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 the trends, and I think that sports and tech just just melt together so nicely. 
and there's like so much potential and some super interesting things will be coming up in the next couple of uh, years and after the break i guess we dive in and see what are those exact technologies and what do lauren peter think about it so it's going to be a lot of opinions <laughs> a lot of uh uh, trashing and like, no, no, really. Opinions but, of old grumpy people. Exactly. Opinions <laughs> of old grumpy people that don't even watch. So. <laughs> <laughs> Here, talking with Peter about uh, sports uh, technology trends and we covered a little bit about the general trends that are been happening for the past couple of years and what would be interesting in the coming uh, year and now we just want to dive in a little bit deeper into the actual technologies and um, how do we see them fitting into what we're trying to do and uh, in general what's uh, what is our opinion on them yeah so let's uh, dig right in and let's start with the biggest one and that's uh, artificial intelligence yes and machine learning everybody's talking about it so yeah everybody and and you know and google and and their grandpa does it yeah exactly nowadays. exactly so. i think it's i think it's definitely worth diving a little bit into and kind of picking them apart because i think for a lot of people that are actually not practicing um, any any of, in any of those fields, these terminologies thrown so you know widely by the general public, and I'm not quite sure that people really understand what the application of it, of it is. And we're hearing of so much of how AI is the way to go and how much we can do with it, but I'm not quite sure like everybody really understands the differences and 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 how and how they could be applied and what kind of cases they're really interesting yeah. uh, in. So, yeah, definitely artificial intelligence might sound very vague and fluffy and... Like... Very fancy. And I think, sadly, a lot of people, when you say AI, people think of like, you know, kind of, um, you know, I, I, I would even go as far as like cyborgs and... and yeah, like, definitely. And, and, and something way, way, way more advanced because of, in a way, all the kind of all the science fiction that we have been exposed to yes, for and, and that is a valid years. that is a valid category of artificial intelligence okay. that's the general uh, general yeah. artificial intelligence we also have to have to understand that artificial intelligence is everywhere everything from from when you're typing an email and it's suggesting what kind of words to come yes. to you if you want to kind of dictate the message with your voice and you know your your phone assistant Siri or your Google assistant this is all AI yes. essentially with the current situation where we actually produce so much information and we can actually tap into it, this was definitely not possible, you know, uh, a few years back. And it's and it's interesting to to think about all the you know all the all the data that we produce and how we can use it. And I think a great example within the field of sports is how we can use those humongous you know databases with a lot, a lot of information to do all kind of interesting analytics. And this is where data scientists come in and and then we can get into anything from all those predictive analytics that can help us either try to 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 kind of predict um, injuries and by that way prevent them uh, big data and um, you know um, kind of uh, uh, data science could be used for helping and kind of optimizing anything from social media to um, you know online sports betting to even kind of customizing the type of uh, you know uh, commercials you're going to be seeing as a kind of really customizing it so big data is definitely one thing um, and i think it's worth also talking a little bit about machine learning and artificial intelligence because they kind of overlap but yeah. also you know there are a lot of variations of them and and our 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 product essentially is using uh, also uh, machine learning and yes. and i and I can say that that is very, very different than, you know, um, let's say a company that is trying to optimize, let's say, a chatbot for like a customer service or, or again, as I said, maybe using machine learning to, to predict, um, you know, uh, possibly injuries or, or kind of to also predict uh, which uh, team would win. You know, and how they would perform at the end of the season. Yeah, definitely. Definitely, we uh, we incorporated some of these technologies into our own product, and uh, well, in our our specific case, we also use uh, one more field that's uh, called computer vision, 
that's also gaining a lot of traction these yeah. days. And let's let's see how it develops. But I see great uh, leaps and advances in, in this field as well. Yeah. But would you would you just maybe cover a little bit of like what uh, computer vision is? Because again, I think I definitely see us understanding very well. But when I yeah. when I definitely talk to people and to friends that are definitely not within the field of tech or specifically within the the, the field of um, artificial intelligence and machine learning, they don't really understand. And and the thing is that people often confuse it because computer vision or let's simplify it to the maximum of like teaching machines to see. In, a, in its core value has been around for many years. Yes. I, you know, um, yes, this field began actually quite some time back and it started with very simple tasks yeah. like Image first detecting, detecting edges, detecting simple shapes like yes. rectangles and, and circles. Yeah, transforming of, images from color to black and white and, yes. and playing with uh, yeah, the distribution of colors with each pixel. And yes. I think it was a little bit more to do with statistics and mathematics at the time. And, and now with the computing power that, that we have access to and the humongous amount of data, things look very, very different in the field of computer vision. Yes. And this is where computer vision, then it did not, but now it definitely overlaps with machine learning. Oh yeah, now, now nowadays it's actually, again, the most, uh, the more difficult tasks, like, yeah, it's, it might be easy to find a rectangle in an image, but mm -hmm. once we get to the more difficult tasks of, okay, where, you know, what's the pose of this human in this image? Yeah. Or, uh, you know, where are all the bicycles in the image and yep. so on. And this is definitely, so, oh God, we can, we can probably talk <laughs> about it for hours and hours, but essentially what is worth saying is that our technology uses computer vision, uh, which helps us actually see the athlete, see yes. how the athlete is positioning himself in, um, you know, in, in certain situations and how that corresponds to the recommended technique and trying to analyze and kind of judge and offer yes. feedback. And it is it is definitely worth probably doing another episode just, just talking about what we do and how we do it. But yeah, it's just, it's just huge. Um, and it's definitely worth people understanding of how those different, you know, different parts of like artificial intelligence, machine learning can because they happen to be more and more like everywhere in, in our everyday lives. They are, they are, they are definitely, uh, you know, affecting a lot of our, a lot of our current life, especially once we include things like smart homes, yep. smart appliances, IOT, yep. that's, that's all using, uh, you know, And would you say, data. would you say computer vision is like something like, how would say, was it like on the high tech end of the spectrum, or is it? How how would you how would you judge it? Uh, I I would say in the past it's been on the lower end of the spectrum. Yeah. In technical complexity, but nowadays people are trying to use it in in a wide variety of fields. Like as I said, like from detecting simple dete detecting what's in the image, yep. image detectors, classification, and. All kind of interesting all analytics. the way up to surveillance yeah definitely. so definitely this field is growing a lot and now the complexity is increasing as well and we see that it's definitely getting better and better but yeah. at the cost of uh, taking more computing resources of course but it's also worth mentioning that uh, when we when we conceptualized our product and our our idea at the first place we we were talking about that there's like so much fantastic technology happening and it's and and basically we pose a simple question is like why do more people like why don't more people have access to this you know cutting edge technology and there's absolutely no reason why that should not be widely available or that should be kind of you know you know held by by certain companies and use just for you know certain very specific tasks that seem maybe more marketable maybe more financially viable and we were just like people should have access to it and essentially this is what we are aiming to do and i really like the way you actually posed it yesterday and i think that we definitely definitely stand behind it and yeah so so what i said was that we want to bring a product straight from the lab to the hands of people yes and i think that's uh it's a very good thing because we see these technologies being in development for months, if not even years. Yep. 
and then they might surface into products like like for example in Google yeah or as you said surveillance and like yeah. use stuff used by the government or like maybe by uh, you know uh, maybe military or in you know huge yes. corporations and so on and and you know oftentimes the credit is not even given to like what the technology behind it is yeah. and I think it's very nice to actually be transparent about you know we use computer vision, we use machine learning. We use uh, human pose estimation. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And and it's definitely our our aim, and I would say one of our main main goals is to really use, um, yeah, um, in a way we, we really mean it when we say that we use kind of cutting edge uh, you know, technology to, to kind of implement to our products. And just, just as an example, uh, one of the key technology that stands behind our product uh, has been released just last year. Yeah, it is actually very new. And I again, I read new research from February 2020. That's fantastic. Again, yeah. e even new, even better. Yeah, exactly. And we're definitely committing ourselves to, to bringing really the top technology from the field and making it accessible to everybody. Yes. So, yeah. Well. So... Next topic, virtual and mixed reality. Oh, God, yes. Oh, I have so many so, opinions about <laughs> this. I just... Again, at work, at uh, previous work, uh, we used to even have uh, a VR uh, headset at oh. work so we can try it and, and play it. I don't know, it's, uh, it's one of those, at this stage, I would call it uh, a cool gimmick. Yep. But uh, we see it being applied to more serious fields yeah. nowadays, like training pilots, army, medical. No, but again, that has been going on for a long time, and I understand how much cool, cooler it is to actually put, you know, VR goggles rather than sitting and looking into few screens. But if you think about it, like military or like, um, you know, civil pilots um, and and you know, or like uh, Formula One uh, drivers have been. Um, have been definitely using this beforehand and honestly I, I, I don't necessarily agree when people say that you know, a, you know art, um, augmented reality or AR and virtual reality or VR is it's the next big thing I just don't agree because you know some some um, some just say like oh my god that's going to be the next big thing that would allow uh, people to, you know, athletes to really submerge themselves into real life situations and, you know, and really feel the pressure of a real game or, and, and all this said, you know, out of context, totally makes sense. You're like, yeah, definitely. If I can, if, if I can simulate real, real game situations, I definitely want this. I don't want to feel like, you know, you know, just, just the basic practice. But then when you, start thinking about what the application of this would be. I don't agree that this is the next big thing. I mean, I can almost not see, and we had this discussion uh, a little bit earlier today, I just can't see many sports where this will be applicable and how would that help prevent injury or create a more realistic experience for the athlete this, this, you know, while practicing. Yes, definitely. I think, uh, I think VR and AR are more geared towards media consumption than actual absolutely athletic experience exactly. or, or or training i think that like consuming sport like spectating sport and like submerging yourself into the experience as a spectator and like all the things that you can do with like custom ads and like picking up rewards with your phone or whatever that is totally cool but like training exercising with with augmented reality or virtual reality um yeah, that, that's uh, not uh, a great uh, thing to imagine, I guess. Uh, you know, not only you have to perform uh, sports with, you know, fast movements and having a headset on. Yeah, and, and, and currently this is pretty pretty heavy. I mean, I can totally understand if we go to to the point where, as, as some were showed, where it's like a very, very thin screen or almost looks like glasses and, and it really kind of gives you the same experience, I can get it, but we're so far from this. Yeah, there, there are plenty of engineering challenges we will have to solve yeah. before we are there. Exactly, and, and, and um, as you mentioned, you know, all kind of, as, as well, like just hardware challenges. Yes, you know. yes, so currently, as far as I know, most of these VR headsets actually have to be tethered with a cable to a computer. Yep. And that kind of sucks if you are on a field and running around. 
Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that might be. Yeah, and, and also, I'm sorry, but like I can't imagine myself training and, and sweating and like moving with this humongous headset and like just, I, I don't know. To me, as I said, I completely disagree. If we're talking about athlete performance, I, would, I completely disagree that AR and VR is the next big thing. As I said, for spectator technology, I can definitely see it happening. But yeah. again, it's still very expensive and I would say not very accessible. But kudos to everybody that is working in that field because I definitely think it is going to be a big thing. It's just not yet. Yeah, exactly. So I would definitely think that yeah, for media consumption, consuming sport as, as, uh, as a spectator, yes. And in the future, again, now we see 5G. Maybe 5G can bring, uh, you know, data bandwidth up so we don't need a cable for VR. Yeah, that would But, uh, but that, that will definitely take some time. Yeah, and, and it definitely gonna be, you know, some time until we can we can make them like really portable and just kind yes. of easy to, to carry and comfortable to, to, to wear as well. Yeah. Another thing that it's definitely worth mentioning and has been a big thing for a long time and I think it's gonna be a big thing for so many years is wearables. Oh yeah. I think everybody these days has a Fitbit. Yeah, I, I definitely do. And I and I always used to joke, like, I mean, since I put my Fitbit and then and then I was, I was joking, I'm like, how would I know if I'm alive without my Fitbit? <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if I don't I have, have my... I have no pulse. Exactly. I, have no, I don't know if I have pulse or not. How do I know if I'm alive or not? Uh, but again, these also have, like... I mean, they're great, and what they what they what they carry as as um, as an inspiration, and how they kind of help us move more, and and kind of makes a little bit more accountable for for you know how many steps we take or how much we exercise, and and uh, and maybe give us some insights on our sleeping patterns and you know kind of movement. But there's still there's still so much to to improve, and and there is like so much research around that they're definitely very good at measuring your pulse. But everything going into kind of, you know, estimating the amount of calories that you burn, even the step tracking is not very accurate. And all these things, it just makes me doubt of like how much, how much actual real value, how, how accurate those are and, and what do they bring to the table for a person, you yeah. know, apart from making you kind of, you know, um, kind of responsible for, for this and like accountable for uh, for some stuff, but they just don't seem to really do the thing that they promise they do. Yeah, that's that's true. Uh, on one hand, I, the the data geek inside me is really happy when I see data. So whether that's just my pulse, for example, that's uh, you know the additional insight and data. It's just uh, nice to have, whether that's during your training or whether that's during your. Even yeah, you if know, you can't trust it. Again. Yes, at that point, once we get into the data that's calculated or estimated or extrapolated, yes, then you have to take that data with a pinch of salt or yeah. a bucket of salt, depending yeah, on... Definitely. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I completely agree. And, and I'm always a little bit skeptical about when companies are um, telling you that they can measure your recovery after sport, depending on your pulse or, or really tell you so much about how hard you train. I guess you could, but there are certain claims of like, you know, kind of doing really in-depth suggestions and really in-depth information that just make me so skeptical about it because, you know, we, this is also what we do and we are so critical when we're building our own product and, you know, very well, every time when we talk about it, we go like, but is it accurate? Can we really trust the data? Can we really, like, we have to put it to the test, we have to see, we have to get it better. And, and it just concerns me when companies do all those claims of like, I can tell you how well you recovered. Well, can you really? Um, why? Because you can compare to how, you know, and I just feel that companies are not very transparent on how they extrapolate those, you know, those, those, you know, those claims or how do they, how do they come to that conclusion? What yes. kind of... And I, I think that makes sense because most of the times these are the trade secrets that they use that they don't want to expose. Yeah, I don't agree with it. I, Correct. I right. just, I just don't, I mean, I really, I really doubt that no matter how much, how much data we have, that you can really make some serious medical claims on, uh, you know, based on just uh, measuring the pulse. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. again, I think mo uh, the other data, 
such as the recovery and, and stuff like that. Again, it comes mostly from statistical sources of like seeing what's the correlation between certain factors and then trying to extrapolate. Yeah. But of course, it's statistical in nature, which means not, you know, you will not get 100% accuracy. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, it also makes me doubt how customizable that data is and how much exactly because it's like statistical extrapolation of like how how much of it is actually an average or like what do they use as benchmarking what do they is it is it your own personal data or is it in comparison to other people and how it's just and again i think the problem that i have with it is the transparency uh in the methods of getting this data or like making those those judgments and making those suggest, uh, suggestions that's that's one thing that i personally really have uh, a little bit of an issue with and it kind of makes me cringe sometimes when I hear you know wearable um, you know the, or companies that, that uh, base um, you know their tech on, on wearables and when they make those big claims it just makes me cringe and I'm like how exactly did you come up to this like and why don't you want to tell us and and then you just talk about some like really big stuff and again we're having the problem of people throwing at the fancy words of like big data and you know analytical this and extrapolation statistical and you know, all the fancy words that it almost makes me makes me get a little bit angry because as a user i'm thinking oh really like you think that if you throw enough like complex mathematical terminology or tech terminology i'm going to be so wowed and i'll be like oh wow, if you guys are using the complicated words, you definitely know what you're talking about. So I'm going to trust what you said. Maybe yeah, I'm crazy. I think, I think there is definitely plenty of cool either math or, or science or data behind uh, you know, their findings. And I think it would be nice to publish it. But mm. on the other hand, if, if that makes them lose the, the, the trade edge, value, yeah, yeah. yeah, totally. Then I, I understand why why they want to keep it. Yeah, I guess well well transparency is something that we definitely want to keep for our product and uh, yeah. uh, and we are yet to 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 tackle um, you know a lot of information and see how we're gonna handle and um, and analyze it. So that will be definitely interesting to follow. And again, you know, as I said, in the sense of wearables, this is definitely those things. Just to put it in in practice, this is anything from like tracking players, uh, anything from biometrics to, as you said, pulse and um, real, real time movement and, you know, anything from rehabilitation or, you know, recovery systems that help you, you know, a lot of, a lot of those things uh, to, to your Fitbit and your smartwatch, of course. Yeah. And, and that was one thing that I actually saw, and I thought this is like so interesting. Um, and I saw something of a uh, analyzing sweat. That was like I was like wow I have to read more about it so it's definitely a you know worthwhile mention yeah that that sounds interesting I mean I've heard about stuff that's a little bit related and that was more of a medical application with smart patches but yeah. I can definitely see that you can get some data from uh, sweat analysis as well yeah. again how relevant that data exactly. would be I don't know as I said I, I don't I don't know whether I want to love this or really trash it because it just sounds so cool and like again the, the the tech aficionado in me goes like oh my god that's like really cool and we can get all this interesting yeah. data of like measuring you know the levels of uh, sodium and chloride and potassium and and uh, proteins and peptides in your in your sweat and so on and then like, the business person in me goes like but what is the value in this is that something that has yeah. really wide kind of application is that something that's going to really help your everyday person like or your athlete or is this something that is just for the top the top percentile of uh, professional athletes that they're just trying to crazy optimize anything that they can i, I don't know I'm yeah just... again exactly that's why i saw it in the medical con uh, context and that makes made sense yeah like totally. for example blood glucose yeah and for stuff diabetics like and stuff yeah totally. definitely but, but for, for sweat, sports yeah Let's see. Yeah, let's see. It's definitely worth mentioning, though. And um, one thing that really crimes against my personal values is just the price tag on all of this. It's it's not cheap. Definitely. And and I've always lived, you know, I, I always believed and I really, really 
um, would like to say that to me, health and sport and like just vitality is almost like a basic human right. And it really grinds against my values when I see, you know, huge price tags on, on technology that does have a lot of value, but still, does it really, is it really worth? And, and we are looking into stuff of like having, you know, Fitbits starting from 80, 90, 100 dollars. And then we go to smartwatches, you know, who, that, that go anything from, from about three to four, five hundred dollars, thousand dollars. And it just goes up from there. And, and I never really wanted this for our product. And you remember at the beginning, we were talking how we're going to tackle all those challenges of accuracy and, and, yeah. you know, and do we need trackers and, and we just didn't want to get there because, you know, price is, you know, a high price tag on, on tech has always been one of the things that I believe that that could be accessible. And price is definitely a barrier for a lot of people to get access to, to that great tech. Yeah, and definitely. Just the price is one thing. And also there are other advantages of, of having just a fully digital product. Yeah. which is, you know, again, we don't need to ship products. Yes. We don't rely on hardware. Yes. We, we basically take a person who just has a phone and all of a sudden he's able to gain insights into his phone. Yes. Exactly. So Definitely I think that's plug great. And, play and, 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 and let's be honest about it. We had a lot of challenges along the way and we will face a lot of challenges exactly. because we're trying to bypass you know, trackers and hardware and so on. But this is definitely something within our, our value system. Is that we want to keep, you know, things really high tech and give it access to so many people. And also the, the, the you know, the huge price tag. Why? 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 I mean, and again, this is coming back to values. And it's one thing for you as a business to make money. It's that's great to make money for, for yourself, for your investors and so on. But there is a certain level that uh, to me, you have to as well remember what you're doing it for. And if you're doing it for the right reasons, this is to help people, to help people get better, healthier, stronger without costing them an arm and a leg. Yeah. And, and, and that is something that not many companies are following. And I really, that is one very, very big value for us as a company. That is why we, we are putting so much effort into our tech so it does not involve any of those expensive hardware. So it doesn't require you to, you know, to wait for it to be delivered. You can just kind of plug and play in a way you download the application, you take a video of yourself, you upload it, and then you get the feedback. And it's super simple. But also behind this user simplicity stands really, really cutting edge tech. And this is exactly what we're trying to do, which I can sadly say not many companies follow this kind of value system. So Indeed, and uh, again, at the, uh, I also understand the companies who go with uh, the hardware choices of using trackers and sensors, because you know even at the beginning I was like, okay, if we use this hardware tracker, it's gonna make our job so much easier. easier. Yeah, exactly. But on the yeah. other hand, if we want to make it hardware free and, and Just, it also be, it's also better for us then we, that we don't need to keep track of hardware and stock and uh, distribution exactly. and all, the, all that stuff. Exactly. And we can make our product accessible to in a way to the world. And that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's kind of interesting. I think we can now pose a question to our listeners. What do you guys think? Like, what is the biggest trends of... Uh, of that year and what is your opinion do you think that all those companies kind of uh, offering tech at a really high price tag have a valid point do you pay for any of them do you have any of them do you use them are you committed like do you love the products and would you if you can change you know that particular tech that you have access to what would you change about it i think these are all very interesting questions to pose so if you would like to let us know what you think definitely you can post it in the comments below we are kind of available on YouTube, on SoundCloud and uh, Spotify. Um, and of course, you can check out the podcast on our website, which yeah. is formfirst.app. There also, we are posting, of course, all the, uh, all the graphs and all the research that we are discussing and talking about. And uh, you can get in touch with us there. And hopefully very, very soon, you're going to have access to our product yes. coming up in the next couple of weeks. So. <laughs> Cool.
well that was all for today we're here and see you hopefully next week yep see you in the next episode bye